Thanks, Owen. So the topic is characteristics of a 10-bagger. Um, a bit of a confusing title, uh, unless you know what a 10-bagger is. But let me, let me unpack it for you. First of all, there's, there's my Twitter handle if anyone wants to follow me. Um, but moving forward, the agenda today is what is a 10-bagger? Let's unpack the definition, understand what the objective really of this presentation is. It's a style of investing. Um, we have some recent examples. Uh, I'll, I'll, it's one thing to always talk, you know, theoretically and academically. Uh, I like to always pull it back to the real world, and, and the investment world is actually incredibly practical. So I've got some recent examples, and they also give us some nice clues as what to look for. Um, and using those recent examples, we uh, pull out common characteristics of, of, of the investments. Um, uh, some of these is qual uh, the quality fact, evaluation angle, and base effect. I'll touch on what those mean when we get there. Um, and then using these characteristics, I've filtered the JSC and taken out an excerpt of, of uh, just some companies to show you perhaps a way to apply it and to give you some leads that you can go and research and look at, look at these stocks and come to your own conclusions. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's just an example of how one can, do, can approach it to take 400 odd stocks in the JNC, narrow it down to a small list, use that list to do much more in depth research to come to a handful of investment decisions or maybe even just one investment decision. Uh, then obviously we open up for questions. So the, really the thrust of this uh, presentation is, is how to find 10 baggers. Uh, we've, we've got to understand what a 10 bagger is. It's really a colloquial term being slang uh, in the stock market for an investment that makes you 10 times your money, 900% return. Uh, there's no magic reason it's 900. There's no magic reason it's a 10 bagger. If there's nothing, you, uh, nothing else you take from this uh, definition, a, a 10 bagger investment is a fantastic investment. It makes you a huge amount of money, uh, multiples of the sum you put in over, over time it grows. So um, the term actually originates from Peter Lynch. Uh, he was a fantastic fund manager, probably in the investment world. Uh, Warren Buffett is overquoted, in my opinion, but I actually think Peter Lynch is underquoted. Uh, he, he's, his style of investing, I personally appreciate much more. And he has a book called One Up on Wall Street. Uh, it's my favorite investment book. If you haven't read it and you like investing in small, small mid-cap stocks, I strongly suggest you read that book. Um, then uh, 10 bagger is actually a baseball term. Bag is a casual term for base. Uh, extra hits like doubles, triples, etc. They used to call two, three, four, ten, uh, uh, four baggers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and hence the 10 bagger term, uh, because of course Peter Lynch is American. But like I said, all of the slide just simplified means you, you've got a fantastic investment. It makes you tons and tons of money. Uh, rises multiples of, the, of your initial investment in it, and and that's the style of, of, of share. We're looking for the style of company and the sort of investment we want to find. So let's have a glance at a couple of recent examples. Some of you might know these companies. Some of you may not. I'll touch briefly on which what each one does before we before we uh, uh, jump into a couple of characteristics. And I've done it very visually. Um, so there's minimal text on these slides. But for those who know what these companies do, uh, you know, forgive, uh, forgive the introductions to the companies because there may be people who don't know what these companies do. Um, Aspen, Aspen Pharmacare, uh, over 10 years, it's returned 2,045%. Technically, that's not a 10-bagger, it's a 21-bagger. That's, that's, an, that's an incredible investment. And you can see this, the Aspen share price over these 10 years starts very low and just ramps up. And in fact, I built this graph, uh, I think it was a week or two ago. Uh, that graph goes even a little higher. They just put out good results and the shares, shares carried on running. Um, and you could see market capitalization, for those who don't know, it's the number of shares multiplied by the share price. So if you were to walk into the market and buy every single share, um, at that price, that would be how much you'd pay for the company. In other words, is theoretically the market value of the company, uh, or at least the equity in the company. 
So uh, obviously, it's very strongly correlated to the share price, but don't forget companies can issue shares uh, so that the market cap can actually, or buy back shares, the market cap can actually change, in, uh, step changes and do different changes to the share price. The point is here, Aspen share price is run strongly, its market cap is run strongly, and the price earnings ratio is the share price divided by the earnings per share or the earnings attributable just to earning one share in the company, i.e. it's what multiple of the earnings are you paying for this company? And the key attribute here, you, you can see over 10 years, well, Aspen's been growing fantastically, ignoring this bloop, uh, or, um, which, which has its own reasons. You can see a share pri a, a sh multiple uh, around about 10, re-rating up to where it's currently trading near, near uh, 35 to 40 times. So you have not just a share price that's lifting up, a market cap that's lifting up, and an earnings ratio that lifts up. Sorry, I realized I didn't introduce what Aspen does. Um, Aspen started uh, in South Africa and started essentially as, as a generics company. Uh, if you know there's ethical drugs in the market, pharmaceuticals, then you get generics, and they copies when these go out of patent. Uh, Aspen started as a South African generics co company. Currently, about 70-odd percent of its earnings and profits come from outside of South Africa. So it's grown so strongly, it's become essentially an emerging market proxy for generics investment. Um, now, that's, that's Aspen. Let's, let's jump on to another one. I think most people in this room will know what Mr. Price is. Mr. Price sells... Uh, let's call it reasonably priced clothing and home goods and the like uh, in a retail format uh, all across South Africa, into SADC and even into certain regions in Africa. Uh, it's essentially a retailer that came out of clothing and it's bolted on house and the like. It hasn't so far gone into consumables. Uh, and when it does, I'd argue it's gone X growth. Um, so with that base, we can see once again, over 10 years, Mr. Price has returned 23,000%. Uh, that's about a 24, 25 bagger, depending on how you round it. Um, once again, share price going up very, very strongly. Market cap going up very, very strongly. The price earnings ratio, remember the price earnings ratio is how, how many, what multiple of earnings is the market willing to pay for this company? And it started on a 10 times multiple. In other words, you're buying ahead of time 10 years worth of earnings, and it's gone all the way up, let's round it up to 25 to 30 times price earnings. The market is actually currently willing to pay more for the future of Mr. Price than it ever has before. Um, next, next case study is Capitec Bank. I think a lot of you guys will know it. Obviously, its big competitor is, is no longer in the shape and form. Uh, that would be African Bank. Capitec Bank started as an unsecured lender and it's moved into retail banking, which uh, in the long run turned out a lot better than moving into furniture. Um, Capitec, over 10 years, has produced 25,000. That's a 26 bag. I mean, these are huge, huge numbers. If you put in one rand into Capitec, it would be worth 27 rand now or 20, 26 rand. Once again, Capitec share price over 10 years started low, goes all the way up. Market capitalization goes all the way up. Capitec, once again, ig ignore the, the, da uh, the data challenges. Uh, Capitec started on, let's call it a roughly a, a 10 times multiple. Um, and through various shapes and forms, uh, okay, it trades back on a 10 times multiple now, but you can see the trend. And this is a linear regression model. You can see the trend actually ticks up. The market is starting to be willing to pay more for Capitec's future earnings than it has before. Um, final example, because there are actually a lot of these. I just thought I'd try to bring out a, a, a couple that we can talk through, is EOH. EOH is mistaken as an IT company. It's not an, uh, it's in my opinion, it's not an IT company. It's actually a service firm who happens to use a lot of technology in what they deliver. And the major service that EOH delivers is uh, what they call BPO, business process outsourcing. It's essentially outsourcing. You can outsource your entire IT function in your business to EOH. And all shapes and forms and other, other types of things you can outsource to EOH, but they can also do project implementation and the like. Um, now, EOH, uh, has an even, even greater return over 10 years, 31, 31, uh, 31%, call it a 32 bagger. Uh, once again, over 10 years, share price just goes up. Market cap just goes up. 
Price earnings started in single digits, and it's currently trading at a price earnings of roughly 25 times. So uh, how now those are the case studies. Those are key attributes, and you see there's a repetitive theme to this. But let's also consider how these companies grew. Uh, EOH has grown predominantly via acquisition. Capitec Bank, as far as I know in their history, basically hasn't made an acquisition. So that's been purely organic. Uh, Mr. Price hasn't really made an acquisition. It's been purely organic. Yet Aspen has uh, grown predominantly via acquisitions. So, so what you have here is you have four different companies from four different industries that that it's not all about acquisitions. It's not all about organic growth. So what are the common attributes between all these fantastic investments? And it's easy to look at them in retrospect, but I'm trying to use these case studies to build how I get to my four attributes. Um, and this is what I think are, the, are the, really the common characteristics that you're looking for when you're analyzing a stock and you say, I want to make a long term investment. And I'm going to jump to the second point first, actually. Uh, notice all of those examples, every single one of them goes over 10 years. I'm not showing you one year graphs, or one month graphs, one day graphs. These are 10 year investments. Um, so the common attribute definitively is there's a much longer time horizon of this sort of investment. If you had bought uh, Mr. Price, or let's, let's say if you'd bought EOH when it was trading at five Rand and you'd sold it when it got to 10 Rand a year later, you would have missed out on that 10 Rand going all the way up to about 100 Rand a share it currently is trading at. I think it might be about 95 odd it's trading at at this point uh, over the next like handful of years. Now that Variable, I'm not going to touch on again, but I want to emph emphasize here. The reason I'm not going to touch on it again, because that's the single variable you guys can control. You can choose how long to keep your money in these investments. What I'm saying is the common theme between all these investments is they are not trades. They are not in and out again and quickly cash out when I made 10% or 100% or 200%. You pick these companies and you stick in them for five, 10, 15, 20 years, as it goes up a gazillion percent. Um, that variable, time rising of the investment you can control. Hence, I'm not gonna actually go into it again here because we are looking at, assuming you're willing to invest for the long term, what else do you look for? So another thing you'll see is all those four businesses are what I like to call quality businesses. Um, very simple point to make, very simple point to agree with in retrospect. You can look at all these shape, uh, all these graphs and say, gosh, you know, Capitex actually turned into a great retail bank. Gosh, Mr. Price, fantastic business, fantastic retail business. But that's only because we have the luxury of hindsight. You're not making these investments in hindsight. You're making these decisions uh, looking into the future. So determining what exactly a quality business is starts to become a little bit trickier. Um, but I will touch on that in, in, in another slide. So we've got, other than the long-term long -term horizon of, of a long-term investor, you're looking for a quality business, number one. All of them are, are that. Also, you'll notice they all started small. If you go back, EOH's market cap started well below a billion. Um, Capitex started, started at about a billion. Uh, Mr. Prices, let's call that 3 billion 10 years ago. Aspen, let's call that, uh, you know, about 5 billion. Now worth, you know, well over 100 billion, and all of them exponentially have increased a, a, a a lot. Where the share price growing is a company growing because in the long term profits grow that. Um, so you're looking for companies that are probably small. It's easy, well, it's easier for a small company to become big than a big company to become bigger. Um, but I'll touch on that as well. Then finally, we're looking for shares that are lowly rated. What I mean by this, and you see all of those graphs, 
is, is a common theme between all of these um, is have a look at the price earnings. Remember I explained the price earnings, is how much are you willing to pay for the earnings of a company? And almost without exception, and once you ignore the noise uh, on the graph, what the, the, the company often started out being lowly rated by the market. They weren't willing to pay a lot for the future earnings. And steadily it re-rated to a much higher price earnings. Mr. Price started on 10 price earnings. Guys, not just the fact is it's much bigger, but guys are now willing to pay a lot more for it relative to its earnings. Uh, once again, Capitech started relatively low and steadily over time, despite the volatility, seems to be re-rating. Uh, EOH as well started on a single digit price earnings, has gone through the teens and is approaching the 30 times price earnings. So every single one of these shares re-rated. Its price earnings started low and has steadily been expanding. <clears throat> so what I like to do, like, like I said, it's easy saying, look for quality companies. You only know that in retrospect. We are buying the future here, and, you, and you're going to be a long-term investor. How do you identify a quality company up front uh, before it's necessarily proved its 20-year track record that it's obviously a robust and well-managed company? So what you find is that success tends to breed success. Um, all the case studies are exceptional businesses. Um, we know that. Now, th the key things you look for for quality is what I like to call the four or five pillars of fundamentals. Now, that just this could not just be a presentation, could be an entire PhD um, and a series of presentations. So I'm going to touch on each of them briefly, but understand that I am touching on it briefly. Uh, Simon Brown introduced you uh, or introduced me uh, at, at this presentation. He's got a website, justonelap.com. He has a lot of webinars on, on unpacking the fundamentals, what to look at. There are a lot of textbooks, a lot of books written about that. Peter Lynch's One Up on Wall Street touches on fundamentals. There's a lot of different approaches. There's a lot of different literature. And more importantly, uh, there's, there's pr probably a much smarter, much more educated people than me that can unpack this uh, at their leisure with much more time. So I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Uh, but technically, you, you want to buy a good business model. There are good businesses and there are bad businesses. Uh, and we can work those out with these, uh, 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 with these other more numerical-based uh, approaches. But does the business model make sense? Look for things like competitive advantage. Competitive advantage means how do they do it better? Do they have a lower cost base so they can they can actually undercut their competitors yet still make good profits? Uh, do they perhaps have a unique selling selling proposition, a niche market? There's there's a lot of literature on that. Look for competitive advantage. Then look for barriers to entry. Ask yourself, could I start a competing company and compete with the business I'm looking at? If you can start a competing company, well, the odds are the rest of the market can as well. Uh, what makes them unique? Think uh, uh, barriers to entry can include uh, you know, massive amounts of capital that are needed. Uh, it may be legal barriers to entry. You touched on Aspen. Uh, once you've got the dossier in, in a geography for a generic, it's yours. Uh, your competitors cannot sell that generic even if they have access to it unless they have MCC approval. That's a good example of, of a legal barrier to entry. Capital, uh, like there may be resource or economic barriers to entry. For example, if you're a mine and you earn the resources on the ground and you've got your mining license, which is a legal barrier to entry, nobody else owns that resource. It's only you who can mine that. Uh, so look for barriers to entry and ask yourself, can this business model be replicated by competitors? And if it can, the odds are, and it's easy to replicate it, then the, then the odds are this, that this is not necessarily the strongest business model. So that's a soft consideration, but you've got to understand what the business does, how it does it better than everybody else, um, and, and, and how it will keep doing it better. And we can often see that coming through in the numbers. Profitability, the point of a business is to make profits. If it's not making profits, I am sorry, it's not going to last very long. 
Now, it doesn't mean it necessarily has to make profits right now. It may be investing to make profits in the future, but at least a reasonable degree of profitability there. And you're looking at things like gross profit margin, which shows your pricing power operating margin, which shows the efficiency and lean structures of the business and the scale uh, it, it can potentially uh, generate returns from. Uh, look at things like return on equity. If you haven't heard any of these phrases, by all means, Google them. We're not going to go into them. They're very technical. But the key essence of profitability is actually simple to understand. Does the business make money? Will it keep making money? And hopefully, will it grow the amount it's making? Uh, liquidity. This is not liquidity of stock. If you're investing in small companies, they tend not to be liquid. What I'm talking about when I talk about liquidity is profitability is often shown on an accounting level. But because of a lot of accounting assumptions, is it backed up with cash flows? That's what liquidity is. It's working capital management. I can go out and sell anything to anyone. Will they pay me? And even better, will they pay me before I do that? We profitability. There's there's a really good quote when I when I was uh, auditing on on a FD's uh, wall I once saw, where uh, revenue is ego, profitability is personality, and uh, cash flow is reality. Cash flow, cash in the bank is the key thing to look at with liquidity. Uh, then solvency is a big word for debt. How much debt does the business have? How is, it, how is it financing all this? Are, are shareholders taking all the risk? Does it have a huge amount of debt sitting on its balance sheet? So where profitability looks at the income statement and liquidity looks at the cash flow statement, solvency actually looks at the balance sheet. And if the, if the company has far too much debt, it's, it's a lot riskier. Any small little downturn or problem is aggravated by financial leverage or gearing um, such that if it may not meet this debt and suddenly its, it's, uh, its lenders knock on its door and it has to close up shop and, and, and sell everything and just to meet these things. Um, but also the absolute absence of debt may, may, may imply that the business is actually running a lazy balance sheet. Those, those are things to consider. Um, and those are hard financial. You find them in the sense announcements with the financial results. You'll find them on the company's website under investor relations or investor tab, go, like where they've got presentations. Go have a look at the financial results, the annual financial statements. All those things will be in there. The business model won't necessarily be there. There you have to perhaps spend a bit of time on the website, interact with the business. Like Mr. Price is easy to understand the business model. Walk into a Mr. Price. Um, use these things uh, to your advantage to go and work out how these businesses make money. But it isn't always obvious. Um, the final one is management. This is a lot harder. And unfortunately, um, uh, he has a fund manager. I, I do this eight to 10 hours a day all the time. I have access to management. We walk in the door. We spend time. And it's amazing when you, when you have your thousands meeting with the thousandth CEO and, fun and uh, FD team that you meet, you start to realize that CEOs and management teams have very different qualities. Some are good and some are bad. Um, it's hard to judge from where you're standing. If you don't have access to management, which is obviously the first thing, that's, that's the first win. But if you don't have access to that, one of the ways you can judge management, and it's a very simple and practical way, and you can do it at home on your computer, go and find old company results. Go and read the prospects section where management talks about what they're going to do in the future, what they expect in the future, and then go and read next year's results and see if that happened and see if they did that. And then read the prospects section for, for that year, uh, see what they expect to happen, see what uh, they plan to do, and go and read the next year's financials. Uh, and results and see once again, did they do what they say they're going to do and did it turn out the way they expected it to turn out? If they're not doing what they say they're going to do and if it's not turning out the way they expected to, the odds are there are not quality management. Um, there is a, it's easy to have good ideas. It's very hard to execute them properly and business, all the detail is in the execution. So that's a way to consider management. So these are, these are the fundamentals. I just want to touch on them, unpack them a little bit for you guys. But, there's, uh, but my, 
my theory of why quality businesses tend to be 10 baggers is not just that success breeds success, but what you'll find is that quality businesses, uh, because of the barriers to entry, the pricing power, uh, the competitive advantages, because they're more liquid, because they're more solvent, because management can execute things properly, they actually have less risk in downturns in, e uh, downturns in economic cycles. Um, so they do better in downturns than their more marginal, worse run, et cetera, et cetera, competitors. And in upswings, that means they're much better positioned and they often grow better in upswings as well. Downturns often wipe out a lot of the competitors. So when an upswing happens, if you're the best business in the, in the industry, highest quality, you can move the quickest, you'll often have actually captured market share during the down, downturn, which is, which is a very nice, uh, uh, advantageous position to be in for an upswing. So you don't just do better and you're safer in the downturns, you actually do better in the upswings as well. Um, so that is what I call the quality factor. Then we've got the valuation angle. Um, and this can get a bit technical. I've, and once again, PhDs can be written about this. We can go into a lot of detail. I've tried to narrow it down. You have something practical you can go home and think about and use. In a nutshell, what you want to do, like all those case studies, just the price earnings tells a story. You can see the price earnings starting relatively low, and you can see the price earnings rating re-rating upwards over those many years. And part of the 10-bagger effect is not just that companies' profits are growing, but the markets are willing to pay more for them. So you actually, the re-rating effect creates a lot of uplift in your investment. Um, so you want to buy it when it's cheap and sell it when it's expensive. Easier said than done. Um, so there's a thing called the price earnings growth measure, PEG. If you hear me talk about the PEG ratio, that's what it is. Remember I, I said what the price earnings is? It's the share price divided by the earnings attributable to that share. Well, how many multiples of that earnings is the market willing to pay for? Now, uh, you can actually take the price earnings and divide it by growth rate to say uh, how many units of earnings um, am I spending for how many units of growth am I getting in return? Uh, and in perfect equilibrium, theoretically, you should spend one unit of earnings for every one unit of growth you get. Uh, it's an oversimplification and doesn't normally work that way. Interesting enough, I've done a back, back test on the top 40, and the top 40's historical peg ratio as an entire market segment is almost exactly one. So there's very little value opportunities in the top 40. And like I said, 10 baggers don't tend to exist in the big companies. They tend to exist outside of the big companies and the small ones. So that's, that's a good example. So um, what you can do is use this ratio. Now, you know as a fact the price earnings of the company. Let's say the price earnings of the company is 10. What you have to try to do with and this is where understanding the fundamentals, understand the business model, the profitability, get a sense for management, get a sense for how fast, and all of that's building to how fast the company is growing. Um, and what you're saying is not just next year's growth. If you had to critically look at this and say, how much per year could this company grow for the next 10 years? And you arrived at the conclusion that this company that has a 10 times price earnings could actually grow quite comfortably at 15% year on year, each year. Now, some years may be a bit lower, some years may be a bit higher, but you're coming to a rough estimate. Then what happens is you're paying for every unit of earnings you're, you're, you're spending, you're buying more than one unit of growth. You're spending 10 units of earnings to buy the share, and you're actually buying 15 units of growth. So that probably indicates that this share over the long term should re-rate, assuming your growth assumption is correct, over the long term, this share should re-rate from a 10 times price earnings to a 15 times price earnings, because then its peg ratio will equal one. And just in uh, assuming everything else stays the same. A re-rating in the share price from a 10 times price earnings to a 15 times gives you 50% upside. 
do that over a couple of years as the profits themselves are growing so that not just are the profits growing, but the multiple applied to the profits are growing and you start to see how 10 beggars fall. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I've largely touched on everything. It's the, the, the key takeaway from this, and uh, Simon will put the, the, the video up. There will be a, a access. You can come chat to me afterwards. We can have questions now. I don't want to get too technical on this again, but if you can buy it for a growth rate greater than the price earnings, uh, and the price earnings is reasonably low, then you're starting to look, uh, it, you, you know, you, it, it ticks a very, very valuable box. So that's the valuation angle. The base effect is simple. Buy it small, sell it large. The same as buy it cheap and sell it expensive. All of those graphs with all of those market capitalizations, just see the company starting off really, really small from a low base, growing to be really, really big. Um, and there's a reason why large companies, think about, think about this hypothetical example where there is a closed economy. There's no exports, there's no imports. And there is a company and the economy is growing at 1%. And there's a company growing at a thousand percent. The company that's growing at a thousand percent, if it keeps on growing at that speed for the rest of forever, eventually it will be the economy. And then it will be growing at one percent because it's trapped within the economy and the economy is only growing at one percent. So the larger a company is, the more its growth rate is constrained uh, because of macro. Uh, and industry and market related uh, uh, things, and you start to become a massive conglomerate uh, or a massive corporate, and there's lots of structures and balance, and you can't move nimbly. But more importantly, just because you're limited to economic growth, the bigger you get, um, which is oversimplification, but it's a, a good way of understanding it. Small companies, on the other hand, um, can actually gain market shares, can actually grow, and can do almost anything in almost any economic circumstance, which also means they can fail in good markets, but they can also grow in bad markets. If you go back to some of these examples, have a look at EOH. That little dip, that was the credit crisis. EOH just shrugged it off. Uh, that little dip, credit crisis. Capitech didn't care. That little dip, credit crisis. Mr. Price didn't care. Um, a good business, and particularly growing for small banks with strong fundamentals, can grow through almost any economic cycle because when everybody else is having problems that's when they tend to gain market share um, so so the base effect and this is why i say you you hunt for 10 baggers not in the top 40 stocks in the jsc you hunt for it probably not in the mid caps as well you hunt for it in the small caps in the small part of the market because they are the small companies. They are the big companies of 10 years time. So using those, and remember I said, one of the key attributes of 10 baggers is you have to hold them for a very, very long time. It's a long uh, investment time horizon. Now that's a variable that's up to you guys to control. So I'm not filtering the JSC by your time horizons. The assumption here is you're willing to hold them for a long time. I've taken the JSC, filtered it a little bit, narrowed it down to what can fit on the slide. Um, just of the smaller companies and ones, and there's there's a mix of them. Some of them meet these attributes, some of them don't. We can we can chat about some of them. I, I suspect there'll be a couple of questions about them. And it's not to say that there's a complete list. It's not to say that any of these will ten, be ten baggers or anything like that. I'm using it as an example that once you filter the JSC like this, you would then for take this list and go and do your detailed research on each one. It's easier to do research on 10 companies than it is to do research on 10,000. So filtering is a very, very uh, useful mechanism to narrow it down to a much more manageable list. So filtering the JSC for quality, or well, actually what I did was filter the JSC for market cap and price earnings. And then I've subjectively, bear in mind this is subjective, uh, marked these companies for quality. So I'm not going to walk through every single one. What I want to show you is a couple of examples, because probably it's easy to say, show me on the JSC all the low price earnings companies. Show me on the JSC all the small companies with very small market caps. You can't say, show me all the high quality companies or low quality companies. That filter doesn't exist. Um, so let me show you a couple of my thoughts, why some have crosses and some have ticks and some have a bit of both. 
And a very topical one would be ARB Holdings and Ellie's. Now, ARB Holdings um, is, is a wholesaler of cables and electrical products. Um, kind of view it as the uh, electrical and ESCOM related market version of cash build. Selling to, uh, selling, selling to resellers and selling to bucky brigades and selling into big tenders on, on power, power infrastructure. And Ellie's has the, has the brands Ellie's, LSAT, it has Me Megatron Federal in the background that builds uh, all the power related stuff. Now, some of these spaces, these people actually compete. Uh, some of Ellie's, Ellie's subsidiary Eurolux, uh, and this is why I'm not touching on the whole company, it's just unpacking one aspect. Ellie's subsidiary Eurolux supplies lighting into, for example, uh, the cash vaults. Um, but it also had access because ESCOM had the residential mass rollout in phase one. And the residential mass rollout was very simple. Uh, you guys might have read of it and heard about it, but guys went around and they replaced all the light bulbs with energy efficient ones. So you're taking demand off the grid. ESCOM loved it. Phase one was a great success. And in fact, Ellie's won a huge amount of phase one rollout. That was a fantastic year for Ellie's. Um, then phase two happened, uh, and phase two was a disaster. It went to an unknown company, and, and who knows what happened. It got pulled halfway, and then they went to the market for phase three. Now, remember I say one of the key attributes, and understand the quality of a business, understand the quality of management, and this will, in my mind, demonstrate why Ellie's has a cross, and ARB Holdings has a tick. Now, ARB Holdings could make the tender, and Eddie's could make the tender. But, and no one's to say either whose tender was better or worse. It was never awarded. Phase three is off, and as far as I know, RMR is not happening ever. Um, but Eddie's pre-stocked huge millions and millions and millions of lots. And these were very specific lots, very just for this tender went and physically bought them and stocked them. ARB didn't. Ellie's has had massive working capital problems, uh, has to rejig its financing. It's been a couple of years. They're still sitting with the stock. They're trying to sell out. They're trying to dump into the market and move into Africa. And there's likely, who knows, going to be inventory impairments and all sorts of things like that. ARB never stocked them. ARB did not have that problem. Now, if Eddie's had won the tender, they would have looked like a genius. But part of the aspect of quality management is you're not just growing the company. You're actually trying to minimize the risk the company is exposed to. And you would have seen that come out on the, on the fundamentals in the liquidity ratios of Eddie's, where its working capital was just eating cash. It was just burning its way through cash, despite the profits it, uh, it, it produced. Whereas ARB does not, as far as I know, have a cent of debt. It's still sitting on a good cash pile, um, incredibly liquid, very, very comfortably solved, solvent balance sheet. One single thing in the market, two people came to very different conclusions with very different outcomes. That's, that's an example of how even though Eddie's on a nine times price earnings and a relatively small market cap of just below a billion has a cross for quality because it serves as a good case study. And ARB holdings on, okay, 14 times price earnings isn't that huge, but you need to chop out property and all sorts of things like that. And it's actually a reasonable price earnings and it is almost double the size of, of Eddie's, um, even though at one point they were the same size. And it has a tick for quality. So that's, that's an example. Now, uh, let me touch on another example, Pinnacle Technologies. Pinnacle Technologies is an RCT distributor. Uh, their competitors are Mustic, uh, Westcon. Uh, there's, there's, there's a range of them, Dardata, even, even to some degree. And um, Pinnacle Technologies, uh, one director was, was accused of, uh, I think it was uh, bribing an official. Uh, it took a year for the company to tell us this. First point. Second of all, um, it, well, it, the company only told us when journalists got hold of this. They might never have told us this. Thirdly of all, um, there were a series, for one way or another, um, there were a series of very questionable trades by directors. Uh, and, and fourth of all, profits have been down 
uh, that we had a results presentation the other day. And I found in my experience, I go to millions of results and deal with tons of companies. And there's only two types of companies when things go wrong. Only two types. The disclosure either gets better or the disclosure gets worse. And in Pinnacle's case, the disclosure got worse. So for all the track record and success that Pinnacle has built up, it took a matter of months to destroy that. And my, my opinion is I, I, I question the quality there. Um, despite the fact it's on the very low price earnings and it's still a reasonably small company. So there's a number of other examples, um, but we, we could sit and talk about and discuss this list forever in the day. I think it's probably time to open up to questions. First, let me just sum it all up in a nutshell. So 10 baggers are simply investments that make 10 times your money. The key point here is 10 times your money, nine times your money, eight times your money. I don't think anyone, any of us will complain on the exact percentage. The point is they're fantastic investments. And they have, just looking at those case studies, they have some very common themes. First of all, you have to be invested in, them in the long term. All of those four examples I showed, on, uh, I showed just now, all of them were over 10 years. You don't trade a 10 bagger, you invest in it. Buy it and hold it. And don't sell it when you're 100% up, because then you're giving away the other 800%. Uh, so you have to be invested for the long term. They're all proven to be quality businesses. Um, you need to buy them when you cheap, well, when they cheap, um, and that just for ease of simplicity is probably when it's a low price to book, low price earnings, um, and the company's going right uh, very very comfortably, and it's probably trading at that position because it's small, illiquid, and the market's never looked at it. Um, something I like to call the information arbitrage because you look at it and do the time doesn't mean that the asset is efficiently priced. It just means no one else has done that. Um, and then finally, they all start off as small companies. Aspens, Mr. Prices, EOHs, Capitex, they all started very, very small. Uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that a massive company, uh, Apple, is going to double in size um, anytime soon. But you can have a couple of these double in size and irrespective of what the economy does, just because they're so small, they can move nimbly and grow and they're growing off a small base. So um, those are really the key attributes. Um, like I said, we touched on fundamentals. That's an entire presentation unto itself. I did skim over it very, very heavily, but it's a very key attribute to understanding the quality of a business. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a good time to open for questions. One we've power there. Uh, one coming through from the webcast. Uh, can you touch on Colgro and full disclaimer? I love Colgro. Uh, what is their, their their strength going forward in terms of the fact that it was sitting with a tick on your column there? Okay, so yeah, full disclosure, I hold Colgro too. Um, so Colgro M3 for you guys who don't know is it's an integrated housing developer. It builds houses. Um, and sells houses. So first thing is we know fundamentally that the housing shortage in South Africa is massive. Colgro's limiting or bottleneck factor in its business is not the ability to build houses and sell them to set, um, the demand is infinite. Their bottleneck is the financing, the project risk they run. So a lot of their competitors actually sit as subsidiaries uh, or divisions within construction companies. And the way these guys approach the building market and building building like a big complex or a integrated development with all sorts of houses is that they use that construction activity to feed their primary business, that's construction. So they, because that's their primary business, this is what they're good at. And when times are tough, they feed it with volumes from these housing uh, uh, housing plans. Um, now, that leads to a funny situation. You built a house, but you haven't sold it. And suddenly it's sitting on your balance sheet and you go, oh, gosh, we've got to sell this thing. We've got to move it. And then that leads to all sorts of other capital problems and all sorts of other market problems. Colgro approaches this entire market, in my opinion, in the best possible way. They invert the entire business model. Uh, they have a risk-based approach. Colgro will not build a house before they've sold it. 
Um, they will not buy the property that they're going to build the massive development on. They'll buy an option on it until they decide to use it. Uh, um, they have mostly variable costs in their business so that if there is a massive downturn, um, they can suck up, give or take, two-thirds of their cost base within a couple months just to just to rein the business back in so they can they can trade through the cycle. They've approached this entire, they're not a construction company. They're almost like a project management company. Um, and they will use subcontractors where they need, they'll bring in their own guys. It's an entire risk-based approach, um, which is unlike anything else that I've directly encountered in this particular part of the market. Because if you can satisfy the housing demand in South Africa, the upside is almost infinite. Uh, and that's that's what I see in Colgrove. It is very balance sheet heavy. They, even their approach still consumes a huge amount of capital, and that's why they've got a bond program, things like that. But uh, they, like I said, uh, and they just approach it on a, on a very nice risk-based approach where they say, okay, what's the key risks? How do we get around them? Whereas all the other guys approach it from, oh, gosh, we need to build these houses to feed the, feed the rest of the business. Um, now what do we do with them? So, so that's why I, I, I tick the Colgro box. It's not just have we been doing this for a long time, and I think it's a great business model, but I think they'll carry on doing it for a long time. Well, once again, I, uh, like, uh, like, like I said, go ahead, read their old results, um, see what the prospects were, see what management indicated they're going to do, and go and read all, all their latest results, and you'll see that unfolding. It's, in my opinion, it's, it's a good quality management team. But management's heavily invested in their own company, so it's no surprise they're running it so well as well. So the, for, for the guys online, the question was, where would I put a company like Cura? The way I'd put a company like, like Cura is, first of all, the market cap is reasonably small. Ticks that box. You know, uh, a couple billion is still reasonably small. When you start broach, uh, breaching 50, 60, 100 billion, you're starting to become very, very big. Um, and I would say it's got a reasonably quality, a reasonably good quality business, reasonably good quality management team, PSG backs it, and the guys will make sure their investment pays off. So I think one could argue very comfortably it ticks the quality box. The problem is the valuation. That's the problem. If you pay too much for a company's future, you risk overpaying for that future, and there's, there's downside. So I would argue that Great business model, small company, um, high quality, but I'm not sure I would pay that price for it. That's where I'd put Cura. Just because something small doesn't mean it's cheap. Uh, so the question was for, for the guys online is what are my thoughts on RPOs, initial public offerings? Uh, you know, that's a case by case basis. Yeah, it depends on who's RPOing, depends on why they're RPOing, and depends on what price they're RPOing at. So um, if if it's a bad business, scratch it off the list already. Um, don't look at it. Don't waste your time on it. Um, then have a, have a look at the size. Is it a small IPO? Is it a big one? IPOs are expensive. Um, so I would say if it's too small, you've got to ask the question, why are they bothering with it? Um, and we have a couple of examples of companies that, have, that are undercapped lies that probably could have raised a lot more and probably could have done much greater things for some other reason they didn't do that. So then you have you sitting with a position where the company's undercapitalized and you know you could be much more aggressive. Uh, and then consider if it's a quality company and you like where it's at, um, if it's of a reasonable size and, and you can get in, then consider an RPO is just like buying another share. How much am I paying for that company? Have they, how are they pricing the RPO? And what price earnings historically? What forward price earnings? And uh, their forward price earnings based on the prospectus, I'd give a good heap of salt onto management forecasts. Um, say, if management misses their forecast by 20 or 30%, is it still reasonably priced? Because, of course, those forecasts come from the company, so naturally they bias. Um, RPOs have their place. But it's very much a case-by-case -case basis analysis. Sorry, there was a question. Uh, so for the guys online, the question is, what are my thoughts around directors' dealings? Um, generally speaking, a director can sell shares for a million different reasons. They he has to um, pay for his daughter's education. You know, his wife wants another uh, car or house. Um, I even know a director who sold 
like half of his holding, and I'm not going to mention the name, so don't, don't answer. Oh, don't ask. But he sold half of his holding because he had a divorce. She took half of his holding. He had to liquidate it. So uh, you could sell, uh, directors can sell shares for tons of different reasons other than it's overvalued. But generally speaking, directors only buy shares, take money out of the bank and actually physically put it in for one reason. It's they, they feel it's good value. Now, that's the popular angle. I'm going to put one more sort of a, a perspective on that is that consider the quantum of the purchase. You know, if if Christo Vies goes out and spends a million rand buying Invicta shares, I couldn't care less. He's a billionaire. What's a million rand to him? It's lunch money. Um, if XYZ director goes out and spends 20 million on it, and you know, and that is a much more serious sum for him, I'd sit up and take notice and go, ooh, okay, he's just put most of his net wealth into this company. Now that is meaningful. Yeah. So Christo Visa's trades in the market are almost ignore um but but some of the other guys you do take note of um that's hard to judge but like i said look at the quantum of it so that's that's the other perspective sorry there's a question back there okay so for the guys online the question is what are my thoughts on adapt rt i've liked it for quite a while um if i go back to this matrix i view adapt rt as a quality business its market cap is still small the question is around price earnings and valuation um, and there you've got to ask the question is trading on the 20 odd times price earnings. Can they carry on growing at 20, 20, 20 plus for the next, uh, next handful, five, 10 years? Um, that is a much more complicated question, uh, like they did in this current period. But if you strip out the acquisitions, they actually grew at 11%, 10, 11% organically, which is not bad. Most companies are going backwards in this economy. So if you can organically grow at 10, 11% in a bad year, Maybe you can do 20, 30% in a good year organically without acquisitions. Um, personally, I still hold Adapt RT. Um, I, I, I still like it. Uh, that, that's actually a good question. I expected that one, though. <laughs> the ARV sitting right there. So uh, the, the question for, for the guys online is uh, Byron has just resigned as CEO of ARB. Um, is that a good or bad sign? And uh, I, I'm not sure what the general rule of thumb is. Generally speaking, if a, if a guy resigns, I would use that as an event to really look at the company. Um, but I would, I would wait to see who his replacement is. Um, but, but we have a lot of management access in, in, in our sort of roles in the, in the market. So I've, I've chatted to Byron and I, and I know his perspective. It was simply a career move. He's been at ARB. He listed it. He's built it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really strong, sturdy platform. And um, BMG within Invicta approached him. And it was just an offer he couldn't turn down. So uh, my understanding of that is it's a career move. And kudos to uh, Byron. You know, good for him, but it doesn't necessarily count negatively to A or B. Uh, it doesn't say anything's going wrong there, as far as I can tell, but I would wait to see who the, the replacement is, because if they get a really heavy hitting guy in, that could be a fantastic event. The, Byron managed to grow it up to a fairly decent size. What is that? It's called a 2 billion market cap company. That's almost starting to go to another scale. If you can get a heavy hitter and you can grow that to a 20 billion market cap company, but if they go and get a bad CEO in, um, uh, very questionable and, and, and the like, I'd view that as a negative. So him leaving, a CEO leaving isn't necessarily a negative thing. I would look at the reasons why he's leaving. Um, and this one I happen to know, but, uh, probably more important than a CEO leaving is who's going to replace him. That actually brings up the question of continuity and corporate governance. One of the, one of the tick, one of the tick marks of, of good company is that they've continuity built in and succession planning and the like. Um, so look, look for that as well. You'll find that in financial statements. Um, largely answer your question. Uh, there's a question at the back there. Uh, the, the, the question is, what do I think of advanced healthcare? 
Um, advanced healthcare would tick the box of small market cap. Um, and in my opinion, it would tick the box of quality. But to answer the gentleman's question around Curo, does it tick the box of valuation? Um, and particularly in advanced healthcare space, you can sit there and I've spent plenty of time modeling it. I change one or two assumptions, my fair value doubles or halves. So it comes down to execution risk. Management said, we want all this money. We are going to go and build day hospitals. Great, go and do it. Let's see how it turns out. And as they do a couple, we will start to know whether they can execute it correctly and it will de-risk the business significantly. And then I would start to use my upper band assumptions or if they start to mess it up, um, I would start to say, well, these guys don't seem to be able to execute properly and I'd start to use my lower band assumptions and the fair value would be much lower. So that, to answer that question, it's a valuation thing. I'm still of two minds. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, guys, for coming through.